Welcome everyone. I am Linda DiMario, Executive Vice President of the Greater Irvine Chamber. And when we launched this amazing forum six years ago, we did so with every expectation that it would be the highlight uh, for the trade and international community in Orange County, um, that it would be the biggest opportunity that we could create for our colleagues to come together, share expertise, and learn from one another. So although we cannot be together in the traditional sense, uh, hopefully the speakers that we're bringing to you and our keynote speaker today and their expertise will bring you valuable information that'll help you chart your way through these relatively murky waters. Before I get to our, uh, in, to our keynote speaker, I do want a very special thank you to go out to those colleagues and those sponsors that stayed with us and have been with us, in some cases from the beginning. Um, the District Export Council, Southern California, one of our great and loyal supporters, and again, stayed with us even though we were digitizing uh, this format. Uh, the champion sponsors, Concordia University Irvine, and Device Alliance, and our corporate sponsors, Edwards Life Sciences and Parker Aerospace. We also want to continue to support and thank the trade agencies and international American chambers that work with us every day to expand our knowledge base and to expand our network and make trade and international development a focal point for Orange County. That's the Women in Trade, Orange County, the World Affairs Council, Orange County, SCORE, and the U.S. Commercial Service. And our international American chambers, the British American Business Council, the Hong Kong Association, the Iranian American Chamber of Commerce, All right, everyone, we're gonna give her a few more seconds to see if her internet clears back up. And if not, then I'll continue with the presentation until she can reconnect. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so sorry about that. It looks like her internet just went out and she will reconnect, but in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and continue to facilitate MC this event. Um, so to leave off where she was, um, we wanted to just thank our partners, including um, all of the ones she mentioned before and also Maple Business Council of Southern California and the Vietnamese American Chamber of Commerce. This event really isn't possible without the support of our partners. So um, to them, we really owe our gratitude and the gratitude of our business community. <clears throat> so today's event is, um, our webinar today is Keynote Mark O'Connell, OCO Global, which is part of a three-part webinar series that we are offering for our digitized, newly digitized Orange County World Trade Week event. Um, yesterday, we had our trade an export overview hosted by the U.S. Commercial Service. Um, we had a few technical issues, kind of like how we have today, but um, they delivered a lot of really fantastic information, and we expect that information to go out to our viewers from yesterday, so they will have access to that shortly. Um, tomorrow, we'll have our panel. So we have some really, really great panelists um, that we're going to be joined by um, to talk about a lot of what's going on in the international landscape, including Brexit, the China tariffs and USMCA. We'll also do a presentation of the Exporter of the Year, the Partner of the Year, and our Global Leadership Awards. So uh, definitely tune in. And if you're interested in attending and you haven't registered yet, please make sure you do so at bit.ly backslash OCWTW2020.
All right. Well, it is now my honor to introduce Mark O'Connell, CEO and founder of Osio Global. He's a well-known and respected figure in the international trade and investment arena across the world. O'Connell serves on the board of International Economic Development Council in the U.S. and is on a number of private sector boards in the U.K. and Ireland, where he resides. And it looks like she's joined back up with us. So, hi, Linda. Um, I actually got, went ahead and completed some of the other slides, but if you want to continue just introducing Mark O'Connell, and we'll just go from there. Uh, well, sure. <laughs> where are, where'd you leave off? I've just started with my introduction of Mark, so um, you can start with his, his um, bio and everything. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to tell you that this is a great personal and professional pleasure for me because Mark and I have known each other for over 20 years, I believe. Uh, we met when we were uh, just in grammar school. Um, O'Connell's work in international trade and investment spans over 20 years. He acquired a full spectrum of trade, export, and investment expertise in the private sector for Saudi Investment Fund, working with a, a quasi-public enterprise Ireland and the Irish Government Export Agency in six years in management consulting division at PricewaterhouseCoopers, specializing in trade and investment advisory work. In 2001, O'Connell established OCO Global, a leading boutique consultancy form, firm which specializes in foreign direct investment and international trade. He employs over 100 professional staff and has offices in New York, London, Paris, Dubai, Frankfurt, Shanghai, and Tokyo, and headquarters in Belfast. They work with private clients to support international expansion, uh, as well as with government agencies and international organizations. Some of their key clients include the UK Department of International Trade, uh, JETRO, uh, Invest Hong Kong, Bahrain, EDB, Italian Trade Commission, Business Sweden, and such development agencies as Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority, Bahrain Economic Development Board, and the Jordan Investment Board. In addition to this impressive list of countries and organizations, he and his team have worked with the Greater Irvine Chamber uh, over the last four years to build a profile for Irvine in the UK among life science and technology companies. We could not have done this without them. We could not have developed the quality of the lists, uh, the, uh, identifying the companies and vetting them properly for whether they were expansion ready and whether they were interested in the US and California particularly. We could not have done what we did without OCO Global on the ground as well. So we thank OCO Global and we thank Mark for joining us uh, today and sharing with us his uh, enormous uh, expertise during these really challenging times. So without further ado, Mark O'Connell, CEO and founder, OCO Global, talking about globalization, pandemic, and uh, pandemic and power, and <laughs> Mark, take it away. Thank you, Linda. I'm just gonna get my screen uh, set up here. Um, Okay, can everybody see uh, the screen in front of them? Uh, yes, sir, you're good to go. Oh, fantastic. So look, uh, good morning everyone, uh, Mark O'Connell speaking and thank you for the flattering introduction, Linda. It's really my pleasure to be joining, joining you this evening at my, my time from Belfast in Ireland. I, I'd much rather uh, be in sunny Southern California addressing you in person, but hey ho, that's uh, the life we're having to lead these days. Um, so I'm gonna canter through, I've got about half an hour with you. And then I think we'll have some questions and answers moderated by, by Linda. Um, so uh, I'll, 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 my, my theme is uh, pandemic, populism and power. Uh, and it's sort of the impact on globalization. Uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister uh, and uh, jointly conceived by myself and Linda a few weeks ago as we tried to confront 
the very different economic landscape that we thought we'd be uh, facing into uh, when we when we uh, planned the conference uh, some months ago. So Linda's already uh, sort of got me off the pass here. So there is uh, just a little word or two about OCO Global. So 20 years in the business, uh, we're specialists in international trade and foreign investment. Our clients are government regional agencies who are trying to attract investment, foster trade internationally. And we also work with private clients, helping them with their international expansion challenges. Um, you know, as I say, we're, we're, we're of a reasonable scale now. We're uh, 100 plus staff. We're also present in LA, and I think one of my colleagues is dialing in from there. Uh, and we've got truly global experience in all continents and, and maybe 80 countries at this stage. Um, I suppose the problem we solve, if I can define it that way, I mean, the world was complicated, is getting more complex. Leaving aside the pandemic, we have disruptive technologies, we have shifts in supply chains, we have rapidly emerging markets, regulations to keep up with. And it's difficult for um, you know, government agencies, not to mention the private sector, uh, to keep on top of all this stuff. And we are kind of the intermediary, the independent platform which connects buyers, suppliers, and intermediaries. We're sort of present uh, in 17 locations worldwide. Um, we have the gray ones are our own offices um, and the others are sort of partner organizations that we work with. Um, I suppose the point of this is we are in these places so you don't have to be. Um, and we, we are the eyes and ears of our clients on the ground, particularly at a time when travel restrictions are in place. Very proud to say that you know we've been uh, with Linda and the uh, the chamber team from the very get go. Uh, I was privileged to be able to speak at your inaugural conference six years ago, uh, and I've been so impressed by the leadership of Linda and the team in growing the the reach and influence of the uh, of the chamber, uh, and particularly the alliance that we've enjoyed as OCO Global facilitating. A, a transatlantic bridge of trade and investment, reciprocal to and from uh, California to the UK. And we focus specifically on tech and, and, and specifically health and life sciences. And, uh, you know, we even managed to make it to the Oscars vicariously with one client who was involved in some of the goodie bags uh, with uh, Forty Medical was her name. So uh, that was as close as we've got, um, but still fun. So, I mean, it doesn't, it goes without saying that, you know, just when you thought things couldn't get any worse between the, 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 the uncertainty in Europe around the UK leaving the European Union, the, the, the saber rattling between China and the US, um, particularly around trade and tariffs, the general sort of sentiment of anti-globalization and, you know, big brands and corporates are evil. Then if that wasn't hard enough to navigate, we've got this uh, global pandemic that's been with us since the end of 2019. So very, very difficult. And I mean, we're, we're all of the headlines today. We don't really know is the answer. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think your own president has defined it as, um, you know, maybe, maybe the cure or the treatment is worse than the disease. And it certainly feels that way from a business point of view, or if, uh, you know, if you look at the, the economic indicators. So the picture is, uh, I mean, if you measure economic performance in terms of gross domestic product, revisions keep going downwards. We've got a comparison between January and April, like just first quarter. Uh, and and it's, it's been felt more acutely in the advanced economies, as you can see, where the forecast was re revised downwards from 4.3 in Q1 at the beginning, down to minus 9%, uh, which is which is pretty terrifying. I mean, the impact then on the business that we're all involved in, whether it's exporting or trade, uh, the scenarios are pretty, pretty damn bleak. I mean, an optimistic scenario down 13%, a pessimistic one down 32%. And everything I'm seeing is that the, 
uh, the, the forecasts are being revised downwards. This is WTO forecasts, just to reference it. Uh, foreign investment, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that you know, not many investors are going to take the exposure or take the chance when there's so much uncertain, uncertainty out there and they can't even uh, travel or engage with the, the government organizations who might be able to support the project. So the picture for 2020 is that FDI will decline in terms of value from 30% optimistic to 40% uh, in the pessimistic, and that might get worse. So down to uh, 800, between 973 and $834 billion. Now this is global, it's not just US, of course. So, I mean, I'm hearing every week more depressing news about unemployment, the societal impact, and I'm sure you've probably got more up-to-date figures than I might have in the UK, but, uh, um, you know, US unemployment, 30 million filed since uh, 1st of March. Um, here in, in the UK, something like 6 million citizens are being paid, their salaries are being paid by the government today. Uh, as in, 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 as relief from the COVID-19. So that's clearly not very sustainable. Uh, and although the chancellor announced yesterday, that's the guy in charge of the money, um, he announced that they were gonna continue this program in supporting furloughed, that means uh, temporarily made redundant workers right up until August uh, or September. Uh, so another quarter of that to, to look forward to and pay back at some point. So what effectively has happened is we basically turned the lights off on demand. Um, I mean, outside of grocery, look at the chart. I mean, it's all red, um, apart from maybe a few household cleaning products. Maybe that's what the blue stands for there. Most of it is is just uh, you know in 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 flatlining, um, no expenditure in the in the first uh, quarter, and the second quarter expected to be constrained too. Uh, I sit on the board of a couple of um, food companies and uh, one anecdote uh, shared with me by a major retailer was that in normal times, um, you know, UK consumers eat, or UK citizens eat, uh, I think it's like 40% of their calories outside the home and 60% inside the home. So, you know, going to restaurants and going out for lunch, etc. accounts for 40% and 60%, you know, home dining. I would imagine that the US is probably the flip of that, where it's even more acute outside home dining and in, inside home dining is, is smaller. But today, I mean, the same guy told me that 10% of calories are now eaten outside the home, and that tends to be for people who are in prison or in hospital, and the other 90% is inside the home. So clearly the grocery multiples are having a field day, um, and can't keep up with demand, but it's one of the few bright spots in an otherwise bleak economic outlook. So back to China then, um, whatever your views on, on um, you know, China's involvement or responsibility in, in, in starting, containing, or just like the rest of us being a victim of this uh, 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 virus, um, you know, it's bad news. I mean, China um, dependency in terms of supply chains we've all woken up to uh, and it's created shortages and slowdowns even when our economies were still open in terms of getting uh, raw material componentry from China. And there's very few sectors that weren't affected and even when we could get them there were delays so you know the the correction will be a remapping of supply chains. I mean in money terms it's a global contraction thanks to just China's ails of $50 billion. And you can see the sectors that have been most acutely uh, affected there on the, on the bar chart. So it's no accident that we call China the world's factory, but how much longer are we gonna accept that dependency? So we have been doing a lot of modeling on the resilience of sectors, the ones that are affected less and those that are most vulnerable. And sadly, the vulnerable way outweigh the, the resilient. So I've already mentioned that food and drink companies are, in fact, in, in good order. Um, I'm not including restaurants and hospitality, clearly, in that uh, box. And everybody, you know, whether it's uh, connected health to 
PPE, personal protective uh, equipment, um, and health services are, are booming. Um, financial services and obviously e-commerce and all related digital payments are neutral to good. Um, investment clearly is going to tank and confidence in M&A will take a while to recover. While tech, media, um, telecoms have all boomed and particularly the kind of platforms we're all getting very quick, quickly used to like Zoom and uh, WebEx, uh, uh, you know, Christmas has come early for them. But then the big high value added sectors like manufacturing, aerospace, automotive um, are in deep trouble because you know, their model doesn't really, their factory production models rely on complex interconnected global supply chains and the production lines aren't set up for social distancing. So those industries are gonna take a while to recover and come back. And then there's other industries like travel, hospitality, and leisure. Look, frankly, uh, I wouldn't like to be holding stocks in any of those. I think uh, they're in for a serious uh, correction. Energy and infrastructure is a game of two halves. Clearly on the energy side, we've got the alternatives and uh, carbon neutral, which are likely to grow, but oil has taken a real tough uh, uh, adjustment in price, thanks to the lack of demand right now. But we go a little bit more specific into some of the by the winners and losers, I suppose. And uh, I've mentioned e-commerce before. So um, in, particular, in particular, home delivery of food, clothing, essential items has, has seen a massive surge, like a almost, uh, you know, 70 or almost 80% growth in revenue uh, since March. On the connected health side, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, the, the, the remote medicine that is already, um, um, taking on and taking off, but adapting healthcare systems to be able to treat people remotely, to isolate, and to um, to quickly scramble vaccines and treatments uh, and protective equipment is really uh, boom time at the moment. And finally, if those of you who have kids will understand um, how how important. Um, the resilience of the education sector will be to be able to uh, teach kids directly. And it's not just children, it's obviously the universities and uh, third level academic institutions have had to adapt quickly to non-classroom based, based learning. And I suspect some of it will never go back completely to the way it was. So moving on then, um, I'll just open up quickly and I'm sorry if you can't see it, it's pretty tiny text, but there's something like, uh, I'm gonna guess, the countries on here. And obviously we wanna be in the countries that are green where the curve is flattening. And there's quite a variety there from Estonia to New Zealand to Iceland, uh, whereas getting there in terms of peak or almost past peak, um, Germany and Switzerland and Denmark, and then those countries, unfortunately, where we're sitting in the UK or where we're sitting in the US, may not have seen their peak yet. Now, I mean, people are looking for patterns in this data. I mean, is there any correlation between the, the you know, hot countries and low infection rates? Is there a, you know, a correlation with low population densities or, or less, uh, you know, urban sprawl? So, it seems that Africa may have got off lightly. It, perhaps those two first reasons would explain that. Autocratic countries, you know, that where martial law can be imposed quickly, like the Philippines or China, where, where nobody messes with the state and there's only one, you know, uh, uh, version of government. Um, so have they managed to contain this quicker because of the lack of uh, freedoms? Um, or my favorite one, which my wife came up with last night, was countries run by women like New Zealand or, um, or Germany uh, or Finland seem to have contained and come out of this fastest. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but I kind of like that one. So moving on then, I mean, you know, globally, I think we are hopefully through the peak of this. And if you look at the direction of arrows, you know, they're going horizontal or or, or, or downwards with the exception of India. So, I mean, it's, it's horrible. The, the scale of this is unprecedented, but we may just may be seeing some rays of hope here. And then back to the central question of this uh, uh, seminar or webinar. 
will the effect of this pandemic and for that matter, the populism uh, politics uh, that preceded it be the end of globalization with countries closing their borders? That's the question I'm gonna to attempt to address in the second part of this presentation. So my sense is that, you know, if history is a teacher or, 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 or uh, informs our, our view, we, we've got to look back to the period pre-Second World War when there was a depression uh, uh, caused by austerity um, uh, and scarcity, and many governments uh, put in extremely kind of uh, uh, onerous and, and, and challenging uh, austerity measures and protectionisms and nationalisms, which in fact precipitated uh, the Second World War. Um, now, what happened afterwards is interesting uh, because many of the Western countries then embraced opening up trade alliances to rebuild their, common, their, their, their economies. I'm thinking about the common market in Europe. I'm thinking about the Bretton Woods Accord. I'm thinking about NAFTA and other significant FTAs. So rather than closing down, people started coming together. And I, I hold out hope that this pandemic may in fact bring us closer together. The trying to go it alone and solve it on your own is not effective because the pandemic respects no borders and companies and countries and policymakers are gonna to have to work together to contain this for the, for the global good. However, we know that um, you know, there are going to be some reconfigurations of supply chains to reduce dependencies. So we're not single, singly dependent on one country or one provider. We also know that we can, accept more, we can expect more protectionism from organizations like CFIUS in the US. And I know in the EU, EU many countries are reaching for policy tools to contain and block investment in certain what they might call critical industries so we can anticipate that and then asia itself is going to have to bring some of its production closer to its customers in us and europe because there's no way we're going to accept that level of dependency uh, going forward so that potentially presents an opportunity and i think the buzzword i heard a german manufacturer say it in one of our previous web webinars, the buzzword of 2020 is going to be reshoring and nearshoring, near -shoring, forgive me. And then, of course, what is the what of the world we're facing into going to look like? What does tomorrow's world look like? Well, I'm going to go through each of these uh, themes and give you a bit of a perspective from the OCO analysts. So, of course, well-being and staying healthy, and we've all of re-engaged with the, the, the value of health as a result of a global pandemic risk. And what we're anticipating is a whole lot more engagement with health checks, health monitoring, wearables, health tech, apps. We're going to have to get used to this because that's how they're going to necessarily contain and track the spread of the disease. So that's actually a growth opportunity and countries like the UK and the West Coast of the US, particularly California, are very well placed. And I've seen some great examples in the work we've done with Irvine um, over the last few years. Then we look at uh, the future of retail and leisure. I mean, frankly, as I said before, um, I, I wouldn't, I'm glad I haven't got a big stock for portfolio in this space. And nevertheless, though, it's moving online. It was already online, but that's going to grow. Um, you know, people are talking about the end of money. Many retailers across Europe have stopped accepting currency and only will take digital payments um, or, or credit. Um, so we may see a hastening of the end of money, which is a germ spreader anyway. Um, E-commerce clearly has been the biggest winner, not just in, 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 in shopping, but also in gaming and education. And then if we're having to social distance, the experience of, you know, pubs and hospitality and restaurants is going to look very different. And even the viability of those, cert of those establishments, if it can't pack people in, is going to look pretty bleak. There was a, a funny letter in the Irish Times last week from uh, a concerned citizen to the minister saying, please, minister, 
hurry up and reopen the pubs because we're all turning into alcoholics here. So I think you can get, my, get where, where my uh, head's at. And then we think about the future of workplace and education. I mean, that's going to look very different too. We've got used to quite quickly and adaptably um, to, to home working. And for, even I've heard about call centers where people are still continuing to work from home and productivity actually went up. Um, education as well. Some universities may get smaller and the accommodation and the attendant uh, lecture theaters may not be as, as, as large as hitherto is the case. And then we can prepare for the, the rise of robotics and drones in this space too. Then there's security. I mean, um, you know, let's get ready for privacy invasion. Um, you know, and it's already starting to track. I understood that in Korea, a lot of extramarital affairs were outed when they started uh, tracking people through their, their phones to avoid the spread of infection. So um, I don't know how many of us would be ready to sign up for, um, you know, tracking of all movements, but it may be governments will impose these conditions on us not to mention, you know, uh, screening us for temperature and sickness as we come in and out of buildings. And of course, that will be uh, opportunity neck knocks for the cyber uh, crime and hackers um, who will be able to harvest and manipulate and abuse some of our personal data. I'm not just talking about the insurance companies. So moving on, um, you know, transportation, I mean, has had the biggest hit of all. I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, public transport systems, airlines, um, you know, we're seeing a huge explosion in, in cycling and, uh, and, 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 and walking to work or walking around town. But I mean, again, massive corrections in the airline industry, uh, even arguably some of those um, organizations may have to be nationalized to survive. And the environment has been a massive winner in all of that. So then moving swiftly on to operationally, what will it mean um, for those of us in business and in commerce? Um, account management, um, it's almost like poor taste to be soliciting new business at a time when businesses are trying to survive. So the best examples and best practices, whether you're looking after your existing investors or your exporters, are not to talk about expansion, but to talk about resilience and what interventions can be made to keep the lights on. Also we're seeing, and these are positives coming, these are a few examples in the UK, where companies and competitors are collaborating to fast track, fast track drugs, therapies and treatments and equipment to combat the virus. And there's plenty of examples of cross-border uh, cooperation too. We had uh, on our annual OCO conference early last week, a great example of an Irish forklift truck, forklift truck manufacturer who had repurposed part of their facility to make ventilators where they can split the flow and be able to serve two or three uh, patients instead of just one. So as they say, necessity can be the mother of invention. And there's some great stories out there about resilient firms. Then on trade in particular, uh, with a number of objections. First of all, of course, governments are going to encourage more self-sufficiency. So we may see a retraction and a regionalization of trade um, so that we're not as exposed to you know, air miles and very distant uh, suppliers and buyers. We also can probably anticipate that um, trade shows will go, vi go virtual. Um, you know, I can't see a good short-term forecast for the big events that we all got used to uh, and enjoyed attending. I can't see those coming back in 2020 and when they do come back uh, they may be significantly diminished and they're very expensive and sometimes not so productive so perhaps new marketplaces and uh, platforms will be uh, accelerated to create that buyer supplier connectivity in a more efficient and cost effective way. That's where I'm getting into the sort of Tinder world of uh, e-commerce. And finally, um, you know, we're likely and we're already seeing more collaborations between firms and cross borders to accelerate innovation 
and address some of the critical issue, issues that we're facing into. So then I'm just going to wrap up uh, over the next uh, five minutes with a, a couple of conclusions. So first of all, I mean, one has to conclude that those, com those countries uh, that tend to, that have been looking inward with populist policies uh, against immigration and um, restrictions on trade and, and sort of protectionist measures seem to be faring worse in terms of containing this virus and uh, you know have higher numbers of fatalities. And that tells me that they're not as well prepared because if anything, the companies that have um, survived and come out fastest are those that embrace cooperation and do not foster division and insularity. So there is a message here, I think, for you know that there's a limit uh, to populist inward-looking policies, which hopefully will be good uh, for the future of trade and, and globalization. And we are seeing resilient sectors, and it's early days. But even in things like you know recognizing the value of the people who work in the healthcare system, particularly in care homes and in community care, um, who are sometimes the lowest paid and you know immigrant workers. Um, I'm, I'm certainly in 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 in, the, in Europe. There's a a weekly round of applause in most neighbourhoods for these low-paid but critical and essential workers. So we're re-engaging with what's important in life, and that's got to be a good thing. Of course, technology and food and drink independence are other issues that uh, we, we will definitely be attracting more investment and more policy attention as we come out the other side of this. Um, the other you know, concern for those of us who are suspicious of monopolies, we are confronting even bigger ones now with the e-commerce giants who, you know, in some cases were already being blamed for the death of the high street or the shopping mall and unfair working practices. Um, and I suspect there will be more regulation and uh, control uh, coming into how governments uh, uh, ensure that there's a fair playing field and uh, you know, traditional retailers have a chance to come back. I think without intervention, uh, traditional retail could be done. I mean, will we ever go shopping again? Will it ever be safe to go shopping again because of social distancing? And will there be any stores when we get there? These are critical issues. There's predictions that 30% of restaurants and uh, pubs and clubs will never open again, which is, uh, you know, pretty pretty tragic for those businesses. Finally, I mean, remote working, as I've already um, suggested, in certain industries has actually improved productivity, reduced cost, and shown the potential redundancy of big tracts of prime real estate. Because um, even when we can go back into them, you know, the density of the workforce and the distancing will be probably be with us for a long time. And then it begs the question, you know, the, the, the rent per square feet and the rent per employee gets, you know, unattractive and unsustainable. Never mind the fact that, you know, large urban concentrations of people are going to feel like a, a, a perilous situation, whether it's metros or subways or huge crowds of people all jamming into the lift. I think we can expect major corrections uh, in, in that space. And then I've mentioned it already, but the buzzword will be, uh, you know, uh, reshoring and onshoring. So we can expect China and Asian investors coming west. Uh, we can expect um, U.S. firms retreating from some of these um, low-cost countries and getting nearshore or onshore. And this kind of rebalancing will, of course, produce opportunities for organizations uh, like um, uh, Irvine Chamber uh, and Orange County. And then, so a key winner, I think, has been the environment. I mean, I'm seeing sort of birds that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, there's fish in the river that even in Venice, I was reading, they were swimming up the canal and they haven't been seen in 40 years. Um, and we're all recognizing that sometimes our cities uh, are, are we're putting a value on public space uh, and nature, which has been sort of underscored by our isolation. And I hope 
that um, some of the sort of movement that we've seen from um, environmentalists over the last 20 years will be taken a little bit more seriously now, not in spite of, but thanks to the, uh, the challenges we've incurred through the, the pandemic. And uh, I mean, look at this. I mean, will we ever be you know, living in uh, you know, highly dense urban environments again where infection rates, uh, I, may, if they persist, this is gonna be uh, uh, lethal. So how do we sort of redesign the sort of uh, urban living footprint? And it probably doesn't look like the picture on the right-hand side anymore. So look, I, I really appreciate your attention. Um, I, I, for one, can't wait, get, get, wait to get back to, um, you know, the pub, the restaurant and go for dinner and uh, plan my next trip to Orange County to see you all. So um, thank you for listening. And I'm going to hand back to our moderator for questions. Thank you, Mark. I knew you'd, uh, I, I knew you'd throw a lot of uh, good bait out there. Um, a, a couple of questions we've got. Uh, one of the questions is, what guidance are you suggesting for those UK companies who were keen to expand their market presence into the US right now? Yeah, well, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm, we're, we're talking to such companies, as, as you know, Linda, and we're saying to hold your nerve. We're saying to keep planning, um, but not pulling the trigger just at the moment. Um, because uh, apart from anything else, there's likely to be, it's likely to be challenging to travel there to mobilize your operation uh, in the short term. But we're confident that the US and UK economies will bounce back very quickly. We're also confident that, um, you know, the, the prize of a new free trade agreement between the US and the UK has been prioritized by both governments. And we're also confident that in certain sectors, and particularly the ones that uh, we both have companies who are uh, active in, whether it's in technology or healthcare, those are going to be even more, um, you know, accelerated industries of the future. So um, while I'm not saying jump on a plane tomorrow, I'm saying keep planning, hold your nerve. And we both, uh, OCO, uh, the UK government, and Irvine Chamber will be there for you to catch you whenever the, it's, it's time to go. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. You know, it, it, we're we're finding that same uh, that same sentiment, which is interesting because I actually thought because you know the globe's all on, sort of on the same page, we're all in the same boat. Uh, I did think, however, that maybe some of our UK companies, even those that have made a commitment, might you know think again. But that seems to be not the case. They're still quite determined to come here. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, Mark, I have another question for you. What are your three favorite must-see, must-use resources for re-entry and regrowth? Well, I think I would start with, you know, workforce. I mean, those companies who looked after their their, 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 their talent, their workforce well through this uh, unprecedented time will be the, you know, last one standing, I would say. They'll, they'll have resilience in that they handled the situation and their, uh, you know, their staff well. Um, motivation and morale will be good and they'll be able to get back to work faster than most. So, so that's the first point. I mean, if you haven't got the team in place, you know, you're unlikely to be able to recover fast. The second one is that, you know, spread is important. I mean, not having all the eggs in one basket in a particular market, whether that's domestic or in a particular sector or channel, uh, that, that is a, a clearly a, a resilient um, strategy. And the third one then, as I've mentioned in the, in, in the keynote, is ensuring that you kept your arms tight around your existing customers, even if they were going through difficult times, whether it's you know, in supply, in, in getting paid, in being able to operate normally, those organizations that kept close and um, were empathetic to the challenges their clients faced will have a client base when 
you know, when, when the lights come back on. So those would be my top tips. Thank you, Mark. Another question, uh, with the growth of e-commerce spending, do you see certain geographic jurisdictions benefiting more from this than others? For example, where buyers are exempt from sales tax? Yeah, I think that's one of the, the great injustices of you know, the, the, the e-commerce uh, boom, because uh, you know, the people who are in the BRICS side of the economy as opposed to the CLIC side of the economy have much more um, you know, onerous um, you know, rents and rates. Uh, you know, I, 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 the, the US term I think is, is, is sales tax and, um, and um, uh, uh, property taxes to pay. So it feels like the playing field is uneven to start with. Um, and then when you get into VAT uh, on top in certain categories, it makes it almost unsustainable. So I would hope that the huge uptick in e-commerce is going to expose some of these inequalities and hopefully level the playing field. Because, you know, I for one would think it was a tragedy if there was no more bricks retail and we were entirely reliant on the uh, the e-commerce giants, um, you know, because clearly there's a, a huge, uh, you know, customer experience in being able to uh, compare and and uh, 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 and socialize and enjoy the, the the shopping experience. But there are certain categories of goods which, frankly, are never coming back to the high street or the mall. Um, Mark, um, a couple of uh, a couple of quick questions before we are going to have to. Uh, turn the page here, but um, we have a question about masks. Um, you know, masks have been in high demand and uh, we've had some supply chain problems. And, and this person is asking, does it make sense to get into the manufacturing of masks as a new business? Um, based on what you shared, is that something we're going to be doing for a while? Yeah, well, one of the ironies that we've all learned, um, particularly the Western countries, um, is that the biggest and almost the sole provider of PPE, personal protective equipment, which includes masks and gowns and aprons and um, you know hair coverings. Um, the, the, almost the global monopoly is China, um, and uh, therefore um, you know. And, and one specific anecdote: we know a company that uh, pivoted from making uh, window blinds into masks uh, within the last eight weeks in the UK and they're now making three million a week. And they told me, and this is, you know, you know, fasten your seatbelts, they told me that they were able to produce them uh, for a third of the price that China produces them. I know it's staggering, but obviously China has taken advantage of global demand and uh, prices are uh, highly inflated. But two reasons why I would encourage the questioner to think about uh, you know, localizing production of um, of masks and other PPE is that we we need to reduce our dependencies as countries on China in this critical area. And two, the economics of it are now making sense, whereas it didn't, uh, you know, uh, four months ago. So yes, would be my answer. You you should definitely consider it. Mark, uh, we're going to have to sign off. There's a Few more questions, and and what I'm going to ask uh, Jessica to um, collect the remaining questions, and uh, we'll send those off to you. Perhaps we could have an email response, and we can send back to the to those who were asking. Is that fair? That's fine, Linda. I, I can see a few of them on my screen, uh, and I will try and uh, I, I don't know how long this platform stays, but I will try and uh, get the answers to the respondents. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you very much um, for your presentation, for the expertise that you've shared, for the thought-provoking um, remarks that you've made. I think that's going to give us a lot to a lot to think about in the future, and it'll help us uh, and inform us in how we move forward. So just imagine that there's uh, hundreds of people that are applauding for you now. <laughs> well, no, thank you, Linda, and it's been my pleasure. And uh, even though it's a very uh, kind of unusual situation we find ourselves in, I hope in the not too distant future, I'll be able to 
come see you all again soon. So thank you for uh, your, your attention. And well, thank you for t thank you for contributing your time and expertise, Mark. We're very grateful. And stay. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. And now we turn to uh, the last wonderful piece of business of the day. Um, as some of you or many of you may remember, the John Colvin Scholarship uh, was started um, six years ago. He was a champion of the chamber, a, an exceptionally generous um, volunteer leader. He helped us actually carve out the pathway to the international initiatives that we enjoy today. And tragically, John died several years ago while he was training for a triathlon. Thanks to the continuing generosity of his family um, and the contributions from uh, the proceeds from the Orange County World Trade Week event, um, the chamber is able to, to honor John's memory and contributions with scholarships to worthy students who display two particular um, qualifications. One is a commitment to their studies, but they're also looking for a healthy lifestyle, which John valued. These students, uh, Anjanette Emily Cisneros, second year of UCI, Isabella Zavalos, first year UCI, Jada Perez, first year UCI, and we have, and excuse me, the last one here is Libby Fan, first year IVC. Each of these uh, worthy uh, scholarship recipients will be receiving scholarships uh, from the John Colvin uh, Scholarship Fund. So congratulations to all of you. I, I wish we could be giving these to you uh, in person and you could hear the applause and, and how uh, excited people are for you. Uh, we'll be sending those, uh, all of those scholarships out uh, soon and with our thanks. So um, what we're going to do now is remind you that uh, May 14, that's tomorrow at 11.30 a.m., uh, we will be closing out our series uh, of Orange County World Trade Week events, navigating the new trade landscape. We will be bringing to you Barry Cosgrave with K&L Gates from the London office, who will focus on Brexit. We're going to be talking with John Evans from Tractus Asia, an expert on the China tariffs, and Kenneth Wengrod, an FTC commercial company, USMCA. So we have a really power-packed program for you tomorrow. Uh, we think that these, these three topics uh, and the experts that we're bringing to you on this subject matter should help you, again, sort of navigate through the really increasingly complex global environment in which we trade and conduct international business. So we encourage you to join us tomorrow at 1130. And we thank you so very much for your attendance and participation uh, in today's program.